This is a production of PBS Charlotte. This week on Off the Record, back to school at CMS. Well, at least the kids are back, but uh, schools are still short on staff and offering signing bonuses for some jobs. Also, should we wear masks at high school football games? And is the Mecklenburg mask mandate even legal? One Mecklenburg mayor says no. City Hall debating pay city workers $250 each to get a vaccine voluntarily or just require vaccines for all city employees. Plus, is it light rail or white rail? We'll talk about census data showing how the blue line affects Charlotte's traditionally black neighborhoods. And speaking of transit, a new study says if we don't spend billions, we'll lose billions. But uh, what if we just built more roads instead? Lots to talk about next on PBS Charlotte. And from our PBS Charlotte studios in historic Plaza Midwood, I'm Jeff Sonier, and we're off the record talking about the stories you've been talking about this week. And if you watch the news, read the news, and listen to the news, well, you'll recognize the names and faces around our virtual table. Mark Becker from WSOC-TV and Dedrick Russell from WBTV. Also, Eli Portillo from the UNC Charlotte Urban Institute and Christina Bowling from the Charlotte Ledger. You can also join our conversation, just email, rather, your questions and uh, comments to off the record at WTVI.org. Back to school week at CMS, a couple weeks behind some of the other school systems. And uh, interesting, I was watching uh, Channel 9 during the week, and they mentioned on the same day that CMS opened, the Rowan County Schools had 1,800 students in quarantine. So it's going to be a difficult year for all school systems. But I suppose the first couple days in the first week uh, went pretty well at CMS. Dedrick, I know you watch schools for us on a regular basis. Want to bring us up to date on uh, CMS's first week? Uh, yeah, well, I guess there, there's been some bumps in the road from, um, from uh, the normal stories, late buses. But this year, um, you know, HVAC, you know, several schools reporting um, no AC. And during <laughs> the pandemic, that is not a good sign. So, yeah. therefore, the superintendent, Ernest Winston, he did say that he does know that there is a problem and that they are addressing the problem. But then some people are saying that um, why was it a problem that, you know, you were the last school district to open in our area, so you should have been more prepared. But, you know, CMS staff, they're saying that, hey, that we got in the schools on Monday and some of the old HVAC system is going to take a while to get the filter because they're 50 year old schools. So uh, so nevertheless, CMS does recognize that there is a problem and that they are going to address it and they're going to address it because th they need workers. <laughs> they need some HVAC workers. So therefore, they're um, offering like like a thousand dollar signing bonus for workers to get inside the school so they can uh, get the job done. Yeah, not just HVAC workers either, but uh, substitute teachers, bus drivers, um, certain teachers, uh, ex exceptional children teachers. I guess all of those job categories are areas where CMS is a little short right now, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, CMS is not immune to the great resignation, the stories that we have been covering for the past month that, you know, that now, you know, through this pandemic, workers are, you know, reassessing their priorities and what they want to do. And so, therefore, there are about 130 teacher vacancies in CMS. Um, and so they need more teachers. And I think we're told that about 400 CMS teachers, you know, called out on the first day. So they needed substitutes, substitute drivers. So, um, so they are not immune to what is going on, you know, in the employment world. Yeah. Christina, you're a CMS parent. Um, can you give us a parent's perspective of what the first uh, couple of days have been like uh, uh, this year? Well, I have to say at my house, it's gone pretty smoothly. I have two high schoolers and an elementary schooler, and um, my children were excited to get back in the building. You know, yes, they wore face masks all day. They ate lunch in their classrooms, but um, no complaints at my house. Um, I think that they were excited to be back in front of their teachers and, and you know, doing the things that, that students do at school, going to orchestra class and in, in person and, um, you know, seeing kids coming in and out of the hallways. So, um, you know, I think there's a lot of excitement. I think that, um, yeah, I mean, it's gonna just be a, a situation where we're gonna have a lot of twists and turns this school year. So as parents, I think everyone's sort of, um, you know, waiting to see what the next week will bring. And I think there's that sort of feeling of trepidation as we're gonna be moving through this school year. 
Yeah, a lot of unknowns, and uh, not just among parents and kids, staffers, teachers, everyone kind of have has question marks right now, right, Dedrick? Yeah, exactly. And you know, the, the big thing is, is that CMS leaders want to keep kids inside the school this school year because uh, they believe that kids learn best when they are inside the school district. So that's why one of the reasons why they mandated um, mask for everybody inside the schools, because school officials say that if one person in that classroom, you know, gets COVID-19, then since everybody in the classroom is wearing a mask, then that classroom will not have to go into quarantine. Only that person who has COVID-19 will be quarantined instead of the whole class being quarantined. So that's one of the reasons why they did do the mask mandate inside schools. So hopefully uh, by doing that, that schools will stay intact this, uh, this semester. But, you know, time will tell yeah. <laughs> what this pandemic will bring to our classrooms. Mark? Yeah, look, every year, the first day back at school is a story, and there's a lot of issues. And I think all in all, and I attended the, the briefing that Ernest Winston did after the first day, and, and they were upbeat, and I think with good reason. Uh, for the most part, things did go well. Um, you know, the mask mandate, I asked if that was an issue, and the superintendent said that they got no pushback on that from staff or, or from students. And when you contrast Charlotte Mecklenburg versus some of the other districts, and you talked about Roanne Salisbury. How about down in Lancaster? I mean, they're, they're, they they had all kinds of problems. And Fort Mill actually, I think, had to close a, a, a brand new middle school uh, for a while till they put the COVID fire out down there. So, all in all, things in, at, at CMS, I think, are looking pretty good. Big problem, all those vacancies, and they're you know running into the same problems that Starbucks and Chick-fil-A and all of the other uh, restaurants are running into, and that's just getting people, right? Yeah. Eli. Yeah, my children are still too young to be in uh, CMS, but we have them in child care, and we have dealt with uh, in the past year, you know, child care centers being closed because of quarantines, exposures, and, you know, that um, can be phenomenally disruptive both for kids' education and for uh, parents and work, all that stuff. So um, I think what Christina said of, you know, the sense of just kind of waiting and seeing, uh, we're used to it now at this point in the pandemic, I think, living with uncertainty, but that feels really different this year, just that sense of not knowing for sure, are we going to have everyone in school? Are we going to have everyone in school next week? What's next month going to bring? Mm -hmm. What are things going to look like? So that um, that kind of lingering uncertainty is really different at the same time. Um, driving around on uh, on Wednesday, I was shocked to see all the buses, shocked to see the drop off lines. <laughs> and for the first time in my life ever, I think I was happy to see uh, to see that traffic out there. Well, speak for yourself, Dedrick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it, 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 it's back to business for CMS. You know, the, and in the um, press conference there, Superintendent Winston said that, you know, our students have wow. been through a lot, how COVID has impacted, you know, students. You know, some of them may have seen their family members die because of COVID or their family members hospitalized or their family members losing their jobs and things like that because of COVID. So he's saying that on day one, that there has been connections with counselors and students to try to get them through this, you know, after they've been dealt with a traumatic um, sense of reality. And also we have to realize that there is an achievement gap that have been in the headlines for months, the achievement gap between black and white students. So therefore, um, Superintendent Winston tells me that there will be a laser type focus to make sure that they can try to close that achievement gap because over the years there has been learning loss because of this pandemic and test scores are coming out next week and, um, and people are prepared preparing for the worst with those test scores. So therefore, um, the job has to be done that CMS has to close that achievement gap in the midst of a pandemic and in the midst of, um, of, of teachers, of losing teachers. So yeah. um, they have a, a, a tough road ahead of them. Yeah, nobody wants to put their kids in harm's way from a health standpoint, but I think everybody looking back at last year realizes that um, there's a risk in not putting kids back in school as well, and that risk is to their overall education and uh, other things to consider besides just the physical aspects of, uh, of the virus. Hey, uh, St uh, Dedrick, one more thing. Um, 
I know that the school board is taking a second look at uh, outside masking, in particular at high school football games, after some social media photos of crowded stadiums and unmasked students. That's not required right now, but is it your sense that, uh, uh, the, at least at CMS, they may be moving in that direction because of uh, th that risk uh, to folks uh, being unmasked at a, at a high school football game? Yeah, from what I'm told, that that could be brought up in, um, in a future school board meeting. But I'm also told that I believe that some principals have autonomy. So some principals could um, say that there is a mass mandate at the outdoor football games because, you know, principals, they do set the dress code and things yeah. like that. So, um, so with that autonomy, some principals, if they think that it is necessary, some principals could um, act that mass mandate before the yeah. school board members, um, you know, take it up at a, at a future meeting. But I was told that when board members heard about that mass mandate and people asking for, you know, mass mandates inside or outside football games, that there was no pushback yeah. from any of the board members. So that may signal that board members may have no problem, you know, having a mass mandate for outdoor football games to yeah. keep people safe. Eli? Yeah, I think that, you know, this gets back to something I feel like I've mentioned every week for a while, but it's just kind of cognitive dissonance in this yeah. pandemic. You know, we have uh, outdoor, some outdoor events, uh, largely outdoor events like Charlotte Pride has been pushed back a month. Uh, Charlotte Shout, uh, the Uptown Outs Festival with a lot of outdoor components um, has been canceled for this year, pushed into 2022. Uh, Garth Brooks concert at Bank of America Stadium. But at the same time, you know, the Panthers are about to start and they'll have a mask mandate indoors, but we'll have tens of thousands of people in the stands. Um, at the same time, you know, we have lots of other events and concerts all happening. Uh, people are going back in school. So I think it's just, it's even harder than it was last year to judge what's the right thing to do um, outdoors, what's the right thing to do indoors? You know, yeah. Oregon just passed a mask, uh, an outdoor mask mandate for gatherings statewide. So we're really seeing even more uh, different decisions, requirements and rules um, in a really fragmented landscape than we were last year. That kind of brings us to our next topic. You talked about the mask mandate here in Mecklenburg County. Obviously, it's an indoor mask mandate that uh, right now affects Charlotte Davidson and the unincorporated areas. As of next week, all of Mecklenburg County will be covered. But at least one mayor, um, John Anarella, up in Huntersville, is challenging whether or not the, the mask mandate is legal. He sent this letter to the... Uh, to the uh, chairman of the county commission this week questioning whether all the things that need to be done in order for a county to order a mask mandate have been done. Um, it gets to that uh, cognitive dissonance or, or mixed message uh, thing we've talked about many weeks here. Um, what's your sense of, uh, you know, the mask mandate today in all of Mecklenburg County. A lot of folks uh, still reluctant to go back to mask, but understanding the need because of the spike right now. And and this particular challenge from the from the mayor of Huntersville. Huntersville. Anybody want to take a swipe at that? Well, cognitive I'll, I'll dissonance. Is that sort that. of a is that is that politics? <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, it's it's tough. Um, you, you know. A year ago, if, if we had the numbers we have now, we were pretty much, we were locked down. Well, maybe we were coming out of that, but you know, here we are uh, with, with uh, you know, COVID numbers as bad as they've been, really. And you know, we're doing a lot of things we wouldn't have even thought about doing uh, a year ago. And I think the difference, of course, is the presence of, of an availability of the vaccine, but still, um, you know, the mayor in Huntersville, uh, John Anarella, I mean, you know, he's saying what a lot of other, um, and, and they are generally, if not universally, Republican uh, governors and, and senators and, and, and mayors are saying around the country. So you can't help but look at it through some sort of political um, spectrum, uh, so the glasses filter, I should say. You know, it, it, it's going to be tough. We just keep going through this. But bottom line is, I don't think uh, the county's going to adhere to what, what or, or listen to what he's saying. I don't think. Right? Dedrick? Yeah, absolutely, because um, so far the county chairperson, George Dunlap, has not responded, and mm -hmm. uh, he probably won't respond that I know of. But uh, but as uh, Mark said, you know, people 
have been saying we need to take politics out of this and we need to follow the science. We know before when people have masked up and when they were in quarantine, we know that the numbers went down. So um, so you, we're talking about people's lives here. We're talking about mm -hmm. a health crisis here. And people have said that you cannot reverse this. If someone has passed away, you cannot push a button and reverse it. So, so I believe that, uh, that, that the health and the science has to take over and, um, and politics has to get out of the way. And that's what some people are saying, that get the politics out of the way and let's keep people safe so we can get out of this and so we can get back to a sense of normalcy. Yeah, let's be clear, by the way, uh, John Anarella is a Republican, but uh, his uh, argument against the mask mandate is based in what he says is state law. He says that the data that was offered by the health department didn't offer any source of that data. And he also said there was no comparison between Mecklenburg and other counties. He says these things are required by state law for a mask mandate. And um, so while ultimately a lot of this winds up being political in this particular case he's citing state law and uh, as dedrick mentioned no no response yet from uh, the chairman of the county commission so uh, not sure whether his challenge to that uh, mask mandate will will be acted upon or not speaking of the vaccine by the way the city council looking at possibly acting offering uh, bonuses to uh, employees who get the vaccine voluntarily. They're not doing that yet. They're looking at the possibility, but um, some council members pushing back saying that's too little too late, that uh, they should be requiring uh, vaccines among city employees. This is an ongoing debate, I guess, among all employers, but uh, it's front and center when your city council is talking about it as well, right, Eli? Yeah, and you know, I think now that the uh, the Pfizer vaccine has gotten uh, the full FDA approval, we'll probably see uh, even more and sharper debates around um, around that question. You know, I think um, the city uh, manager said that they, I believe, were in the the 60s already uh, percentage wise yeah. for vaccination, and um, you know, hope to increase that through this um, carrot approach. But you know there were some hints that they could be looking at a uh, stricter approach going forward. I think um, New York City has mandated all of their public school employees, that's about 148,000 employees, get vaccinated. Uh, we've already seen that with the local hospital systems. The Pentagon is requiring that for active duty armed services members, but there's still gonna be pushback. You know, the I was just reading yesterday about the New York City Police Union planning to um, file a lawsuit to stop vaccine requirements if those are imposed on uh, police officers in that city. So there's a lot of push and pull. And one more quick thing is uh, Delta Airlines announced that for unvaccinated employees, they're going to add a $200 a month surcharge to their health care plans. They say that's to cover the cost of hospitalizations, people who need to go on ventilators and such. They say that's entirely uh, unvaccinated employees. So I think you're going to see those those sticks getting uh, bigger and sharper, even at places that don't have comprehensive mandates. Dedrick, you had yeah. some thoughts. Yeah, you know, I talked to um, City Councilman Malcolm Graham about this, and he says that you know it's disappointing that you have to you know offer money for in his eyes for people to do the right thing to you know to get the vaccine but on the other hand if you know if the city has the money then um then why not spend it because they do have the money with the you know federal relief plan so that's where this money is coming from um but 250 dollars and then if 75 percent of of people get the vaccine then they'll get another $250. And, you know, some council members said that maybe it's just a, a little too late that if people have not been encouraged to get the vaccine now, then uh, by now, then why would $250, you know, be an incentive for them to get the money, to, to get the vaccine? So it'd just be very interesting to see if this will work. And as Eli said that, you know, this could just be, um, you know, in the crystal ball, that the next step will be that we're going to increase your health insurance if you don't get the vaccine. So uh, so a lot of people, and, and it's very interesting how private companies and government, that how they're doing what they can in order to get people um, um, vaccinated. Yeah. 
You could also get more donuts from Krispy Kreme, I guess. That could be an incentive. <laughs> if 250 bucks doesn't do it for you, maybe the donuts will. Um, hey, by the way, um, you talked about the cost of hospitalization. I know the city said that the cost of offering the bonuses is about $3 million, which is a little more than what they're paying right now for the cost of hospitalization, uh, city insurance for the 800 or so folks who have been hospitalized because of COVID. So there's kind of a balance there in terms of, you know, do you, do you spend the money to get people vaccinated or do you spend it after the fact on hospitalization? Uh, a discussion that council will continue. Uh, they haven't voted yet, but they, they may soon and we'll keep an eye on that. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the goal line finally uh, on track to be uh, serving folks from Johnson C. Smith to uh, Plaza Midwood uh, with streetcar service as of next week. But the discussion comes just as uh, the Charlotte Observer did a story regarding how light rail, how rapid transit affects traditionally uh, black neighborhoods in Charlotte regarding uh, gentrification and the changing demographics of, of those neighborhoods. We've seen uh, census figures that kind of uh, crystallize what a lot of us uh, can see for ourselves with our own eyes over the years. But uh, anyone want to talk about light rail and, and, and how um, uh, it's, it's changing um, those neighborhoods around it, both for the good and in some cases, in some views for the, for the bad? Uh, yeah, Jeff, well, I was going to yeah, go echo kind of what you Oh, sure. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I was going to echo what you said, where this the study that the observer did, I mean, it really sort of just put numbers on something that if you've been paying any attention that you've seen play out um, over the years. I mean, the numbers were um, still to see the numbers. It's kind of shocking when you look at yeah. uh, neighborhoods like Optimist Park and Wilmore, um, you're seeing 200 to 400 percent increases in in the number of white residents around those um, in those neighborhoods. And so, you know, it just does still get at issues of um, that, that people in those neighborhoods are having with, you know, property tax bills going up and, and rising rent and, and all the things that come with gentrification of areas like that. Mark? Yeah, I remember standing outside of the, the, the new extension. It's no longer new, I guess, up toward UNC yeah. Charlotte and Optimus Park and talking with a woman there who said, you know, it's great, but I just wonder if I'll be able to afford to, to live here anymore. Listen, the best part about light rail and, and that kind of thing is that it attracts growth, it attracts business, it attracts people and it attracts people generally with money. And the worst part is it attracts people and pushes <laughs> others out. Mm -hmm. um, so it, yeah, I mean, it, it, it is, look at South End, you know, where, where it is and where it was 10 years ago. So yes, that's going to happen, and and um, it quantifies that on some level, and at the same time, uh, it's sort of what we can all see. Eli, yeah, I think uh, given you know the housing shortage we've seen here, right. what the real estate market has done, we're not seeing this uh, only in areas where the light rail has been built. We're also seeing yeah. uh, a lot of demographic changes in west side, uh, east side neighborhoods, places that have traditionally been uh, majority minority. They're being changed quickly. Anywhere kind of in the inner ring, um, you know, is just seeing an accelerating wave of redevelopment. And there were concerns about whether the 2040 plan by allowing duplexes and triplexes would um, you know, incentivize more redevelopment in more of these neighborhoods. So I think that we're gonna keep seeing questions about this, these uh, demographic changes along transit lines and also just in our uh, inner ring neighborhoods in general, because there's uh, redevelopment pressure and gentrification pressure throughout this city. Yeah, Dedrick. Dedrick. Yeah, you know, you know, as they say, knowledge is power. So that's yeah. why. So it's more important now than ever before that African Americans who live in those neighborhoods to make sure that they reach out and find the resources that are available for them to stay in their homes. There are resources out there that will, you know, help give the strategy, give them the information that they need in order to stay in their homes and so they can afford to stay there. Um, so uh, so it, information is key yeah. and there are programs out there. And so that's why, you know, I encourage, you know, people who are out there who are dealing with that to reach out and to find out the resources that are available for them so they can, uh, you know, stay where they've been for many, many, many years. Yeah, one last uh, fact from uh, that Observer story. It says, uh, in the uh, neighborhoods that don't touch light rail, aren't uh, close to the light rail, a 20% increase in black residents. In those neighborhoods near light rail, a 6% drop 
in black residents. So change is coming, uh, whether it comes because of rail or because of the proximity to uptown. Uh, it's a lot of change uh, for those uh, neighborhoods to digest. Uh, one other transit item uh, before we wrap up this week, a report that says if we don't spend $13 million on uh, mobility and transit, we could lose $28 million or $28 billion rather in economic uh, benefit um, because of congestion on roads. Um, any thoughts on whether transit is, is truly uh, an answer to congestion on roads? Let me jump in because I, I kind of go back with history right. back to when Charlotte was first looking at light rail. I took a trip out to Portland, <clears throat> Oregon, where they had just opened up a new line and they were trying to generate momentum for a second. A progressive city generally uh, thought of at the time. And there was a lot of pushback to the new line. And the answer that someone, you know, one of the talk radio programs said, look, everybody loves the train. They're cute. They're great. They're beautiful. They're sweet. They're sleek but they don't necessarily take traffic off roads. Traffic has actually increased on roads. They bring more people in maybe than they put on the actual trains themselves. So yeah. we're seeing the same here, I think. Yeah, it's a transportation project, but it does other things as well. And in some cases, those other things are the real mm -hmm. benefits, I suppose, that the that the city and the region realize from those uh, from those uh, light rail lines, including jobs and development and uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, we're just about out of time, but uh, a lot of stuff to cover this week. And obviously, some of these uh, topics that we have covered this week are recurring topics that we seem to cover every week. So the, the discussion, as they say, will continue. In the meantime, I want to thank our regular panel of guests for joining us here on Off the Record and also invite you at home if you're watching at home and uh, have comments or questions about what we talk about or what we don't talk about, feel free to uh, uh, email us at offtherecord at wtvi.org. In the meantime, thanks for joining us this week, and we'll see you next time right here on Off the Record. Production of PBS Charlotte.